Today we have with us once again Paul Mann, the CEO of ASP Isotopes, trading on the NASDAQ under the ticker ASPI. Paul, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. It's great to see you again. Great to see you too. ASP Isotopes operating in a highly specialized niche within the advanced materials sector. Would you please give us an overview of your company's mission and how your isotope enrichment technologies are set to disrupt several major industries? Yeah, well, isotopes are used every day, and you touch them every day without really even noticing it. And the majority of isotopes in the world are supplied by Russia and China today, so there aren't really many Western producers. So our goal is to bring uh, a new supply of isotopes to enable many industries in the future. Industries such as, such as advanced semiconductors, nuclear medicine, and, 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 uh, and obviously nuclear power. Uh, that's going to really change the world and make the world a better place for us all to live in. And they all need these special isotopes, which our company is focused on producing. Now, your technology, which is proprietary, allows the enrichment of a wide range of isotopes, and I think you'll agree this gives you a strong competitive edge, Paul. Now, could you also elaborate on how your technology differentiates ASP isotopes from its competitors, and what are the barriers that exist for others trying to enter your space? So we're working on two different technologies, both proprietary to, to enrich isotopes. The first is the aerodynamic separation process, and the second is quantum enrichment. Uh, both differ from traditional centrifuges in that they require a lot less capital, they're much smaller in footprint, and you can produce light isotopes as well as heavy isotopes, things like silicon-28 in the form of silane, which you can never produce in a, a large centrifuge. Yeah, both our technologies came from South Africa, and they were developed in the, sort of the 1970s and 80s, We've advanced them much since then, and we've reduced the amount of energy we require to make us really cost competitive. In terms of the barriers that exist, you know, our technology is classified as dual-use technology, so, so we're regularly inspected by the International Atomic Energy Agency, and we're controlled by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that creates significant barriers to entry and hurdles for, for the spread and, and release of this technology. Now, how big is the overall market for this technology, Paul? Well, <laughs> That's very, you know, it depends very much on which isotope we're talking about. So carbon-14, perhaps that's a $10 million market. We've signed a take or pay contract there with a customer for a minimum of $2.5 million a year. But clearly the, the nuclear fuel market is billions of dollars, and we've just signed two MOUs with customers that require in total over $37 billion of, of nuclear fuel between now and 2037. So very different. Some markets are small, some markets are large. Our technology allows us to compete in many different end markets, and you know, clearly the, the, the opportunity is, is depends so much upon on the end market. Let's talk about a favorite subject of yours, Paul Halu, in which your technology could play a very critical role, especially for next generation nuclear reactors. Give us an update on the progress you've been making on this front, and how do you see ASP Isotopes' role evolving in the global energy market? Yeah, so, so it's, it's really exciting. The world requires um, a lot of new nuclear fuel in order to meet 2050 climate goals, particularly a new, new type of fuel called high SA, low enriched uranium. And right now, there is no Western producer for commercial metric ton quantities of, of HALU. So we've, um, we've signed two MOUs with large US-based SMR companies. And our goal is to start producing HALU this decade, ideally by 2027. Now, you know, in terms of our technology and our, our plants, we've been doing a lot of research on non-uranium isotopes, which would be applicable to uranium isotopes, as and when we get the relevant permits and permissions from governments to, to move into this field. But as I say, we require permits and permissions from governments to do this. And we're talking to three, three governments right now, and hopefully we'll get those required permits or permissions in the next sort of several months, and that'll, that'll allow us to start building a uh, first Halu plant. Let's turn now to Quantum Leap Energy. You've mentioned plans to list Quantum Leap on a national exchange. Paul, provide us more details on that timeline and tell us, what are the potential benefits for ASP Isotope shareholders? So you know, we've always said that nuclear fuel and nuclear medicine are very different businesses. We've always said we're going to spin out or a separate entity for the nuclear fuels business. And our goal is to do that as soon as, as it's practical and sensible to do it. 
So I would expect us to want to achieve a couple of milestones before we do that. I think we'd want to have the permission from at least one government to start building a HALU plant before we do that. And it'd be nice for ASBI assets to be generating free cash flow at the time we spin that out as well. So we're, we're hoping you know, as soon as possible, but maybe it's in early 2025. We'll have to, have to wait and see. And now finances and the balance sheet, Paul. You've taken several steps towards strengthening that balance sheet in, re in recent months. What is the company's current cash position and how will this money help to accelerate your path to profitability? Yeah, no, and so we've actually never had as much cash in our balance sheet and there's been a stronger, stronger cash position we are today. We've raised about sort of just over, over $30 million in, um, in July via an equity raise. And we raised about $25 million during the first half of the year by a convertible bond, uh, by a convertible bond um, issuance into quantum leap energy. And, and so, so we're in a very, very strong position right now. Um, you know, our free plants are, in South Africa are, are, are pretty much constructed. There's not much capex they have to spend on those. And so, so, you know, this new capital we've got will be used to build additional plants in places like Iceland, and hopefully in quantum leap energy for nuclear fuels. Uh, you know, we, we have a, we've got a very tight ship here. We don't spend much money. Um, I wouldn't say tight fist is the word, we're frugal. Every dollar we spend, sort of 30 cents is management. And so we're very careful how we spend our money and we'll remain laser focused on costs um, you know, forever. Uh, but yeah, we, we feel very happy about our cash position today and our ability now to, to really build more plants and, and turn this into a great profitable company in years to come. You know, just further elaborating on those operating expenses, they were more tightly controlled in 2023, and that resulted in better than expected operating free cash flow for your company, Paul. And what are some of the measures? Give us some more details on the measures that you're implementing to maintain this financial discipline as you scale up operations. You know, it's actually really simple. We don't hire lots of people. We don't have lots of expensive buildings. We don't travel in private jets and that kind of stuff and have lots of drivers for us. You know, we, when we get in the plane, we typically turn right rather than left. Um, you know, that's, that's how we kind of control costs. You know, we, we spent the first two years of this company with just two, two non-South African executives in the C-suite, myself and the chief operating officer. We basically do all the roles ourselves. Uh, the CEO role, the CFO role, the COO role, the head of business development and the head of sales and negotiating with contracts by ourselves. So, you know, one of the one of the clear signals we've had from both uh, shareholders and the board of directors is we have to hire or strengthen our C-suite. And that will lead to a slightly higher OPEX in 2025 versus 2024 and 2023. So maybe we we'll spent about $5 million in OPEX Last year, that goes up a little bit in, in, in 2020, 2024. We just hired a, hired a CFO, a chief financial officer. So again, that will help us file our timely reports to the SEC and, and improve the corporate governance that uh, is already good, but could, it can always be improved. Paul, wrap it up with the essential value proposition. Why should an investor take an interest in ASB isotopes right now? Listen, we're a small company operating in a highly restrictive, um, you know, large barriers to entry industry. Uh, where there's a strong demand for a new producer of these very special materials that will enable many of tomorrow's megatrends, things like advanced computing, uh, nuclear energy, nuclear medicine, space exploration. None of that will happen without um, new materials and new isotopes, and we hope to be the leader in, in, those, in, in, in those fields. It is truly a great story, Paul. We love working with you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for your interest.